All right, so things we got to go over today have to do with the different kinds of microscopy. Obviously, yesterday you used what kind of a microscope? What went through it? Light. Hence, it is a light microscope, right? Because it magnifies or alters the path of the light that travels through it in order to make the image larger. Um, other types of microscopes would include electron microscopes, and there are a few different kinds of electron microscopes, and that's what uh, else we'll go over today, and we'll talk about uh, the importance of that. Now, if you uh, only printed off the Science 10 notes package, this will not appear there. This was only in the Science 10 AP notes package. Okay, so if you didn't print that one out, you won't actually have this lesson or the other one that I'm going to go over today because we're going to go over two. Right. These are extra ones that are only in AP. So if you don't have it printed, you may just want to have your phone out or whatever uh, with notability or whatever open. Okay. Uh, so learn the types of microscopy, understand the advantages of light microscopes and the advantages of electron microscopes. They have advantages and disadvantages. Okay. All right. So role of microscopes in biology. Well, Obviously, we didn't know anything about what we were made up of until Hook came along with his 30x microscope and discovered that cork was made up of little tiny empty rooms. Okay, and of course, after that, the science of cellular biology kind of took off, and we were able to understand that everything, the the sort of basic unit of living things, is the cell. In the same way that the basic unit of matter is the atom. Okay? We're all made up of cells, different kinds of cells, certainly, specialized cells, certainly, okay? but it wasn't until we had the ability to look at them that we figured this kind of stuff out, and then we're able to understand a lot better okay, how living things actually work. Right? So the microscope essentially increases our ability to view things. Obviously, we can only see a certain size. Beyond that, our eyes cannot resolve something into um, you know, a more coherent image, which is why when we look at, um, let's say, fabric, for example, right, we don't see the individual threads most of the time, right? We just see that this thing is made out of some sort of fabric. We don't see all the, you know, intricate patterns that, were, that put them together, especially if it's something like cotton or nylon or, you know, any of the sort of microfiber kind of materials. Can you see it if it's wool? Okay, why can you tell, why can you see the, the sort of individual parts with wool, but not with cotton or any microfiber? Right, okay, wool is simply bigger, right? I mean, it's, it's off of a sheep, right? It's, it's hair, essentially, and so we, we see it because it's big enough for us to see. When it's woven together, right, we can still see the individual strands. So like on a sweater or something like that, right, you can see the threads. On a scarf, you can see the, the, the threads of the fabric. You can resolve that because your eyes can see the difference between one part and the next. Whereas with microfiber, you don't. Okay? You simply can't discern one single thread from the next. All right, so microscopes used by early scientists were all light microscopes. Okay, visible light passes through a specimen and then through glass lenses, and the lenses then reflect, refract the light, magnifying it and projecting an image onto your eye. All right, we'll uh, for now ignore the effect your eye has okay, on the image because it obviously has lenses within it as well. So if we're looking at a light microscope, it looks pretty much like we were using yesterday, except that this one is a binocular um, microscope, whereas ours are monocular, right? Only one uh, eyepiece to look through. Okay. Um, and then an electron microscope looks quite a bit different, and it's quite a bit bigger, and a lot more expensive, which is why, of course, we don't have one. All right. Um, so you have basically uh, an electron microscope. You have a source of electrons, which they call an electron gun, and then you have lenses, but not lenses like are in a light microscope. Okay. In a light microscope, they're actually pieces of glass or plastic or whatever that refract the light. In an electron microscope, they're magnets. Anybody know why? John? Right. Magnets can alter the path of electrons, or any charged particle for that matter, but in this case, electrons. Um, that's why the uh, there's northern lights, which if, if you've looked out, the last couple of nights have been really good. Actually, the last couple of nights have been really, really bright green uh, northern lights. Those are, those happen because the Earth has a magnetic field. Essentially, the Earth is a big, giant magnet. Okay? And when charged particles from the sun slam into our magnetic field, they get 
altered, their path gets changed, and they get are forced around the earth, which is good because we wouldn't want them to hit us or we'd fry. Right? So they get deflected around the earth, and when they get deflected around the earth, they get slowed down, and as a result, they give off some energy in the form of light. That's why we see the northern lights. Okay? That's kind of a simplified explanation of how it works, but it's essentially how it works. With, uh, with an electron microscope, we adjust the position of these magnets in order to focus the electrons into a point okay, or a beam that can be used to go through a specimen and then give us a better, much more resolved, magnified uh, image of it. So you've got these condenser lenses, which are magnets that are forcing the electrons together. Okay, you have this aperture, which essentially controls how many electrons get through. Okay, uh, you have your objective lenses. Okay, down below here, and then at the bottom, okay, you've got your uh, you got your specimen here, okay, and you've got these electron detectors that essentially reflect off of there. Okay, and this is where the image would be made. Now, do you actually look through a through a lens and see an image in an electron microscope? No, it's like an X-ray. Okay, it's it's more of a picture that you view afterwards. All right, did you sign in? All right. So, properties of microscopes here. Okay, the import two important things that you want to know about a microscope are first off, yes, it's magnification. That's important, certainly. Right, but you also want to know something called its resolving power or its resolution. Okay, now we're probably a little bit more familiar with this in terms of like computer monitors and televisions and, and things like that or you know com like your phone screen if you, you know if you have uh, like a cheap tablet the resolution on the screen would be really low as compared to like a more high end tablet where it might be you know like 1080p or something like that that would be very high resolution right um, the human eye can resolve down to about 100 micrometers Right or one tenth of a millimeter, which is why you know we can see an individual hair, you know, and things like that. They're they're very very small, but if I put two hairs right side by side, I could probably tell that there were two hairs there as opposed to just one. That's the resolving power of the human eye. Okay, is our ability to see the difference between two things. Right. If I go to a light microscope, it can magnify quite a bit more, obviously, but it can resolve images that are much smaller than that. Right down to a hundred nanometers, which is um, one tenth of a micrometer. So obviously, far more resolution than the human eye is capable of. When I look through there, I see things that are much smaller than I could possibly see. Right? When you uh, picked up those microscope slides yesterday, and you you know if you put them up to the light, you could probably see little specks on them. Right? Especially for the amoeba and the paramecium. Right? But could you tell if some of those specks were a single amoeba or paramecium, or two that were right side by side? There's no way, right? We can't resolve to that level of resolution, right? But the microscope very easily can. An electron microscope, the advantage of an electron microscope is its resolving power, right? Way, way greater than a light microscope, okay? We are talking down to femtometers, okay? Very, very small, right? 10 to the minus 10 meters as opposed to a light microscope that's not quite even 10 to the minus 7. So we're looking at a factor of over a thousand times more resolution from an electron microscope. Okay. And the same would be true if you compared, uh, you know, like old uh, cathode ray tube television screens to now modern high definition plasma televisions. All right? The resolution is way different. Anyone ever watched like stuff that's not in HD on an old CRT TV? It, it's it's painful, right? Especially if it's a hockey game. I don't know how I managed to watch like sports on those things when I was your age, right? But you just you suffered through it because you didn't know any different, right? But now you got this HD stuff and you can pick out every tiny little detail, right? Does that make sense? Right? So it's kind of the same idea. So if we're looking at kind of real world applications of this, okay? Resolution of one meter means you can tell one person from another. When they're standing side by side, okay, uh, ten to the minus one meters, you know, you can tell a human hand. Ten to the minus two, you can see that I have two fingers stuck together as opposed to one. All right, down to kind of the limit of our of our vision, which was the example I used there, the thickness of a human hair. All right, 
down below that, another 10 times smaller would be a single cell. Okay, 10 times less than a single cell would be a single bacterium. Okay, and then a virus. Okay, macromolecules. So if you're looking at something that's very big, like protein or something like that, a big molecule you could probably see with uh, with an electron microscope. Small molecule, maybe even with an electron microscope to some extent. Atom, not quite. Right. We do have some electron microscopes that are able to show generally okay, very, very large atoms, but not small ones. And we don't see any detail. We don't see protons, neutrons, and electrons. We see kind of a, well, the picture I saw looked like if you bought a tray of 48 eggs. Okay, You guys know what that kind of looks like from the top, right? You look down, you see all these the tops of all the eggs kind of together. That's kind of what this looked like. Right? It was just it was a solid, so the atoms were packed tightly together, and that's kind of what it looked like from the top. Couldn't really see very much, okay, but sort of see. Okay, so this gives you a little bit more idea of kind of resolving power here. Okay, if I'm looking at this little uh, like water flea, okay, something like that, like a little tiny uh, insect or or crustacean. Um, Looking at it with the human eye, I can sort of see its shape, but I can't see the really fine details of sort of the uh, the ha well not hands the the legs and kind of the claws and things like that that would be on them. I can't see those with the naked eye; they're too small. I can see the general shape of the water flea, but that's it because the resolving power of the human eye is about as big as these circles. All right, so where any of these circles can fit in, all right, that tells me how much detail I can see. But if I suddenly take a magnifying glass or a microscope, the resolving power is much greater, and now I can actually see the little claws and, and bumps and, and things like that that are on there because the resolving power is greater and these little circles fit in okay, quite a bit better. Everyone follow me there? Right, so that's why we'd see greater resolution. So if I was looking at it from this point of view, this is what I would see, the general shape of the water flea. Okay? But looking at it through something with greater resolution, I see much more detail. All right? Same idea with telescopes. All right? This is looking at, um, I think it's looking at Pluto. All right? So ground-based images of Pluto show Pluto to be only a few pixels across. Right? And you can see that, yes, there's a bright area, and then kind of dimmer, and then another bright area, but it's hard to tell. Right? But when you get the Hubble Space Telescope, look what you see now. Right? You can tell that Pluto has a moon. In fact, it has many, believe it or not. All right. Everybody follow me on that? All right. But for the longest time, people didn't know that. What's that? It is a dwarf planet. It's a dwarf planet. It does not dominate its own orbit. Okay, because there are things just as large as it that are in its orbital path. It uh, has a highly elliptical orbit, as opposed to circular, um, and it orbits outside the plane of the ecliptic. Thus, it is not a planet anymore. Those were the things they made. There was a big fight over that. Okay, when Pluto was demoted, there was like rioting by by nerdy science types. But okay, um, yeah, Th what what they mean, guys, essentially is. All the planets, here's the sun, all the planets orbit within this plane, except Pluto, which orbits out here. Okay? All the other planets orbit within the plane, the, the plane called the ecliptic. That means that if one moves in front of the other, it causes an eclipse, right? But nothing can eclipse Pluto because it goes outside of that. What's that? I'm not saying better or worse. Okay. Yes, yeah, I actually I saw the show on that actually, yeah, yeah. he got yeah he w he actually had to move. People were threatening him. It's like get a life, people. If if that's what you have to really get upset about, you got a pretty good life. If the thing that's most upsetting to you is that Pluto's not a real planet anymore. All right, so light microscopes, okay? A light microscope cannot resolve detail finer than about two-tenths of a micrometer. All right, now the stuff we were looking at yesterday, they were several hundred micrometers most likely. So we could see a fair amount of detail, all right? But if I'm trying to see the details, the small parts within a bacterium, a bacterium is only a couple of microns, micrometers across, okay? 
with a light microscope, you can see it, and you can tell the difference between one bacterium and the next, but you can see virtually no detail within the bacterium because those things are smaller than two-tenths of a micrometer. Everybody follow? Right? So there's, there's a limit to what you can see. Sure, it's great for looking at living things that are microscopic, but from a microscopic point of view, big. Right? It's, it works fine for those. Looking at our own cells, our own cells are quite large, right? and so we can see detail within them. We can see the parts within, because even the parts within are still you know, 30 micrometers across, or 10 micrometers across, or whatever. They're big enough to see. Right? Uh, so light microscopes can, can magnify effectively to around 1,000 times. Okay? Your best light microscopes using an oil immersion lens can go about 1,000 times. All right, the most powerful one I ever used was a thousand times used it in university, and they are incredibly finicky to use. All right, like you're using that fine focus knob and you're barely turning it. All right, and and things are going in and out of focus all the time. Special lenses, though, they uh, they require oil to be on the specimen and on the lens in order for the light to refract through properly. Okay, it helps the light to transmit better, and as a result, you can magnify more. All right, so they're called an oil immersion lens. You always have to clean them. It's messy, it's, but they work. They, they really magnify a lot. Okay. All right, so the resolution of a light microscope is limited by not just the lenses and the quality of the m workmanship, but also the wavelength of visible light. Okay, light's made up of waves, all right, and they have a certain wavelength. If you're going to be able to see stuff with them, you can only see stuff that is, you know, going to allow the light waves to sort of fit in there. Right, and they have a certain wavelength of a few hundred nanometers and anything kind of bigger than that, and it doesn't work very well. All right. Now, with an electron microscope, electrons are obviously very, 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 very small. Okay. Um, as a result, they're smaller than the wavelength of visible light, and so they can create a much higher resolution image of an object. All right. This here is an electron microscope picture of a DNA molecule. Okay. Yeah, well here it's kind of out of focus. Right? Um, when you're using certain types of, of you know, electron microscopes, some of them resolve very well and some of them don't. Right? They, there's still limits to, to them. But this one here is showing a fairly well focused okay, picture of a, uh, elect of a DNA molecule. Now, this is what I was explaining to you before on how the electron microscope works. Okay? You've got your electron gun, the source of electrons, and it is Okay, drawn out okay, by the magnet. The, the uh, electrons are actually pulled away, and then when they get through, their path is altered back to a point, and then again drawn away, and they go back to a point through the specimen, okay, and then they are blown up okay, on the, uh, the imaging slide, okay, or phosphor screen, okay, where the image is made, just kind of like taking an x-ray. Right, now, what's the disadvantage of this process? Right. Whatever you look at is dead. Right. Nothing survives either the preparation process for this or the, the process of being bombarded by high energy electrons. Okay. It would be like if you were to be in an x-ray machine for an hour and a half. I mean, you, you would either you know, turn into the Hulk or die. Okay, one of the two. Okay, well, it's the same thing. If you're bombarding a small microscopic organism with high energy electrons, it's going to kill it. Right. The other problem is is that usually to prepare it, you have to coat it in uh, precious metal. Usually it's gold. Sometimes it's platinum. Right. But the process is that you almost it's almost like a spraying process. It's frozen and then it's sprayed with this material that sticks to it, and that allows the the electrons to reflect off of it more easily, and that creates a better image. So the preparation process usually also kills whatever it is you're looking at. All right, so resolving power is inversely related to the wavelength of radiation a microscope uses. Right? So what that means is the smaller the wavelength of the light, the better the resolution. That's what an inverse relationship means. As one gets smaller, the other gets larger. Okay. So the smaller the wavelength of light, kind of common sense, the better the resolution because, okay, the, the easier that stuff kind of fits in. Okay. All right. And these are great if we're trying to look at 
subcellular structures. That would mean structures that are smaller than the cell, inside of the cell, things like viruses that are very, very small. Okay, it's great for doing those because it can resolve a lot of detail on small, small structures. I mean, you figure this is a DNA molecule. When you look at, it, at the cells and we do our cell anatomy lab, you'll be very lucky if you see the nucleolus, which is this fairly large circular structure within the nucleus. Never mind the fact that the nucleus is full of this stuff. Right? You normally don't see it because it's too small. All right, so modern electron microscopes can achieve a resolution of about 0.2 nanometers. All right, so that is, you know, 10 to the, what, minus 9 meters, whereas a micrometer is 10 to the minus 6. All right, so it is quite a bit more powerful, all right, 1,000 times better. Okay, and two types of electron microscopes, transmission electron microscopes and scanning electron microscopes. The difference is what parts of the specimen they show you. If something transmits, that means it goes where? It means it goes through something. Okay? To transmit means to pass through. All right? So things are transparent, like windows, because light can transmit through them. All right? Whereas the wall is opaque, because light does not transmit through the wall. Everybody follow me on that? So a transmission electron microscope will go, the, the electrons will go right through the specimen and down onto a screen. Whereas for a scanning electron microscope, the, um, the picture is of the outer surface. All right? So it reflects off of the surface and scans the outside. All right? Both give really cool looking pictures, all right? but you've probably seen ones from a scanning electron microscope of things like spiders and stuff like that, and they show like intricate detail of the of the insect, I'll show you one in a minute. All right. um, yeah, they they show just the outside surface, and again, you get that detail through the special preparation process of coating them with precious metals that are highly reflective. All right, so a transmission electron microscope, okay, aims an electron beam through a thin section or slice of the specimen, which is usually why you have to freeze the specimen before you do this with liquid nitrogen, so that you can make a really really fine cut of it because it's become a solid and you can slice off a thin slice. All right. um, so what we're seeing here are electron microscope pictures of organelles, parts of the cell. This is a mitochondria here on the left. Okay. So this is a single organelle within the cell. And you can see that it's got these folds on the inside. The mitochondria is the organelle that burns sugar for energy. All right. This here, I believe, is showing us the Golgi apparatus, which is responsible for getting rid of waste within the cell. It's kind of the garbage man of the cell. All right. We would probably not see, unless we really knew what we were looking for, these structures within the cells that we look at the next time we go in the lab. Right? They're simply too small uh, for us to see unless you really know what you're looking for. Okay? But look how much detail the transmission electron microscope shows us about them. Okay? A lot. Okay? Even the smallest parts okay, of, the, uh, of the organelles themselves are showing up. Okay? Their own membranes are showing up. All right, so they're usually used to study the internal structures of cells, and this has been really important in knowing how cells function and what each organelle does, because they can take pictures of them at various times and go, oh, well, all right, this, this looks different over here because this process is going on or whatever. So they've, they've told us a lot about how cells work. All right, and then scanning electron microscopy. All right, so you get these really cool-looking pictures that are just of the surface of the object. All right, here is one of those actinopods that I showed you the other day. A light, I showed you a light microscope picture of it. This is an electron microscope picture. And you can see all the little edges and points and whatever else. This is a human hair. All right, under an electron microscope, you can see, you know, all the little kind of cracks and things like that that are in it. This is a spider face of a spider, right? And you see all the eyes, yeah, okay? And, and uh, the mandibles and the legs and, and all the little uh, protrusions and hairs. Yeah, you grossed out yet? Right. And this, this is mold down here. That's what mold looks like under an electron microscope, the stuff that would grow on the surface of an orange, okay? The penicillium mold that grows typically on oranges and things like that. That's what it looks like. These are the spores that you can see here, these round parts, whereas this part here is the feeding structure called the hyphae, 
Okay, it's kind of like roots that, that uh, get in and actually secrete the enzymes that digest their food. This, an actinopod. It's a shell. It's a shell of a, an amoeba. Like it's an amoeba with a shell, essentially. Okay, and this is its shell. So they feed by sticking parts of the cell out through the holes, right? And then it, food sticks to it, and then it pulls it in. Yeah. All right. So you do see lots and lots of detail, which is pretty cool, really. All right, but like we said, the process here of preparation, okay, the beam scans the surface of the sample that has to be coated with a thin film of gold. It is not a cheap process, all right? Not that it's a lot of gold, but it's still using gold, all right? And uh, usually you have to have, you know, very fine particulate of gold and, and obviously, a, you know, kind of a flash frozen, very hard specimen, okay, for that kind of stuff to work. Again, you have to have like a, almost a spray, a spray of fine particles of gold, or it has to be molten and kind of go over it. And yeah, like there's there's a, a couple of different ways that that's done. Yes, that would have been a little bit more of an expensive process, I would think. Okay, yeah. All right, when you're thinking gold's what now, about four hundred dollars an ounce, okay, something like that, it adds up, right? All right, so electron microscopes can reveal things to us, especially organelles, okay, that's parts of a cell, the little parts of a cell, that are impossible to resolve with a light microscope, okay, but the light microscope offers advantages in that what you look at under the, the light microscope can be alive and actually doing things that you can watch the processes happen. If you're using an electron microscope, you have to take pictures of different ones at different times and then try and compare them because you can't watch something happen under an electron microscope. You have to take a still photograph with it and that's it. Right? Whereas you could take a video of something underneath a light microscope. Okay. All right. Um, so that's all there is to know about microscopes. Okay, there'll be a little bit of stuff, maybe multiple choice kind of stuff on your unit exam. Okay, on microscopes, the different types. Okay. All right. The other thing I want to go over here is stuff about viruses. Okay, talk a bit about how viruses work, what they are, okay, uh, how they make you sick, okay, things of that nature. Now, for the longest time, before electron microscopes were really viable and effective, people figured you got sick because of what? Germs. All right, it was germs was a general term for anything that made you sick. All right, but germs now actually doesn't refer to viruses. Germs refers typically to bacteria. All right, and we yes, while well, bacteria can make you sick, the bulk of the health problems that we face, okay, in terms of pathogens, that is organisms that can hurt you, are viral. And we had a big problem with this for a long time because every time somebody got a stuffy nose and a cough, they got prescribe penicillin. All right. Penicillin's great, make no mistake, but it only works on a small range of bacterial species. It does absolutely nothing to viruses. All right. What penicillin does is it dissolves the cell wall that surrounds certain kinds of bacteria. Well, viruses aren't cells. They don't have cell walls. They don't have any cellular machinery. Penicillin does absolutely nothing to them. In fact, they'd not e they wouldn't even know if you took it, right? And that created sort of some problems. People were overprescribed, and then you know stuff started uh, you know happening where we started getting resist things that were resistant to penicillin, bacteria that were resistant to penicillin, and things like that because it was simply overprescribed. Now we have even more powerful antibiotics. But again, antibiotics only work on biotic things. That is bacteria. All right. Uh, a virus, you have to take antiviral medications. There aren't very many of those, and they're quite hard on your body when you do take them, All right. and they don't always work. So viruses are much, much tougher to kill. The best way to deal with a virus is to be vaccinated against it. 
right, to teach your own immune system to recognize it when it's present and then take care of it before then. All right. Now, if you get a viral infection, how do you feel besides rotten? Weak, okay? Weak would be one of the biggest symptoms, all right? I mean, not that you feel great when you have a bacterial infection, but typically with a viral infection, you feel quite a bit weaker. Does anyone know why that is? Well, they don't steal your DNA, but they do go into your cells, and that's the problem. Viruses are really, really small. Your body has to, uh, you know, hunt them down and kill them with cells that are quite large. You can get a lot of viruses within your body in a very short period of time, and we'll talk about why in a few minutes. But it's really hard for big cells to go looking around for things that are really, really small. And inevitably, they don't stay alone in your body for very long. They attach to one of your cells very quickly and get inside of it. So then what's the only way to kill the virus? Kill the cell. All right. So when you get a viral infection, your immune system is forced to destroy your own cells to kill the viruses. All right. So you imagine like you have a killer T cell, you know, coming up to a, an infected cell and going, "Oh, that's too bad for you. You got to die." <laughs> okay? You're infected, and the only way to cure the disease is to kill the patient. Sorry for you. Okay, and so that's that's how your body takes care of it. Because if it doesn't kill that cell that's infected with a virus, that cell will produce up to thousands more viruses. All right. So your body just says this is the lesser of two evils. If I leave that cell and don't kill it, that cell will produce a thousand more viruses that will go out and infect a thousand more cells and suddenly make my job exponentially worse. I kill that cell, I stop the problem right away. Okay, and so that's what has to go on. So what we got to do here is identify a virus from structural descriptions and know the parts of a virus, understand how viruses live and reproduce, and understand why viruses are being studied so carefully by modern medical science. There are some good things, MJ, that uh, viruses can do, and also look at how a virus can spread or become more virulent. What does virulent mean? Virulent means make you sicker. Okay. Also, infect more effectively. All right. So, uh, how many of you get the flu vaccine every year? Anybody? Okay. So a few of you do. All right. I mean, the flu is a highly infectious organism. It isn't terribly virulent. Most of the time, it won't kill you. All right. But there are some versions of the flu that can be very virulent, highly infectious, and okay, uh, deadly even in some cases. Especially if you're elderly or you know have a suppressed immune system because you've got uh, you know had a an organ transplant of some kind or something like that. So t people do have to be very, very careful right, around certain types of viruses. All right, so the first thing we have to realize, very, very important, viruses are not cells. Okay? In fact, there's debate as to whether they should be considered a living thing at all. We went over that the other day. We said, here are the things of a living thing should be able to do, and living things all have to be made up of cells. Well, right off the bat, viruses aren't cells. Right? So by that definition, okay, they shouldn't be considered alive. They also don't do any of the other things we said a living thing should do. Carry out metabolism, access nutrients, okay, things like that. About the only thing they can do that was on that list is reproduce. And they can't even do that without making another cell do it for them. All right? So very kind of borderline consideration there. So essentially what they are are infectious particles that consist of essentially just genetic material and a protein shell. Okay, give you some idea here. These are electron microscope pictures of different types of viruses. Okay, this first one here is the tobacco mosaic virus. Right, this one will never make you sick. It only infects tobacco plants. Hence the name tobacco mosaic virus. What it does is creates a modeling pattern all over the leaves and actually essentially makes the leaves no good for drying and putting in cigarettes. Okay? They're very small though. Okay? You get the idea here. This is ten nanometers right, across. So very, very small. That's what uh, one one hundredth of a micrometer. So this thing would be two 
two hundredths of a micrometer across. Okay, very, very small. This is an adenovirus. Okay, it looks kind of like um, a cube with antennas coming off of each corner. Right? The influenza virus uh, is tougher because it's got its protein shell and then it's got actually kind of a membranous coat around the outside that covers up its protein shell. And that's what makes it difficult for your immune system to take care of. Your immune system detects viruses by detecting proteins that they're made up of. Those proteins are not normally present in your body. So it's essentially a chemical detection right, that, that your body uses to decide whether something is belongs to you or is foreign. Right? So bacteria, same idea. They're made of stuff that isn't normally present in your body, so your body attacks attacks it because it's foreign. Well, same with this. But if it's covered with this membranous material, the membranous material is made of the same stuff that your membranes are made out of. Makes it a lot harder for your immune system to discern where it is and then go after it. Okay. And then lastly is another one that probably wouldn't affect you or I very much. It's called a T-even bacteriophage. Right? The reason it's called T-even is there's literally hundreds of different kinds and they're all given T dash and an even number. Okay, so T2, T224, T566, whatever. Okay, they're all given an even number designation. And these are the ones that are being used by modern medical science in gene therapy. All right, um, what they do is they engineer these viruses artificially. And they put certain strands of DNA inside them. And they utilize the viral life cycle to change the DNA of someone's cells. Right. We'll explain how that works when I go over the life cycle here in a minute. Okay, so again, viral structure, there's not much to them, right? Like I wouldn't even ask you here, label this diagram of a virus because you'd go DNA, protein, done. Right? That's how little there is to them. So you've got okay, your viral genome. Genome is a term referring to genetic material on the inside. Okay? And then you've got your protein shell on the outside and sometimes you have you know, um, special membranous proteins on the outside. This, incidentally, is HIV. Right? That's the HIV virus. It has a very distinctive shape. It's got this kind of trapezoid kind of thing on the inside, and the genetic material is in there, and there's two copies of it. Right? Um, so it's what we call a retrovirus. Okay? It's got its capsid on the inside, and then it's got this stuff here. These enzymes on the outside. Right. Uh, the other one that's on here, okay, the herpes simplex virus. All right. So uh, there's obviously different types of herpes. Right. There's the the sexually transmitted variety, and then there's like the cold sore, typical cold sore variety that doesn't really hurt you very much. Right. Um, they they are typically similar in structure. Right. The viral uh, genome is again on the inside, and then you've got this core of DNA, and then you've got the capsid on the outside. This is the tobacco mosaic virus under a better electron microscope photograph. Oddly enough, it sort of looks like cigarettes. Okay. Hey, now, like we said, some viruses have accessory structures that help them infect their hosts, like the influenza virus. Okay, so this kind of diagram here of the influenza virus shows the RNA on the inside, the capsid, and then this membrane that goes around the outside. Now again, the outside of the membrane still has markers on it called glycoproteins. They're proteins that have sugar attached to it. And your body can still find those and identify the, the material as foreign and then get the immune system going after it. Okay, and then these are the, the bacteriophages. They look sort of like the lunar lander. Okay, and that's actually what they look like, believe it or not. All right, so the DNA is all held within the, the head here, and then there's these tail fibers. It, it's not, don't get the idea that it's like robotic and it actually moves these fibers around like legs and walks. It doesn't. These are simply anchors. They're sharp on the edges, and when they catch your cell, they stick to it. Okay, so it just helps to anchor it. All right. So the big thing about viruses is that they are parasites. Okay, they are ob what we call obligate intracellular parasites. If they come into contact with something they can infect, they will. All right. If they don't, they very quickly break down and quit because there's nothing to sustain them. Right. Um, but they can only reproduce within 
another cell. They cannot divide on their own. Right? So they don't have any enzymes, there's nothing for metabolism, no ribosomes to make proteins okay, or any, anything else. Okay? Each type of virus can infect and parasitize only a limited range of host cells. Right? Uh, for example, if you're, you know, you're at home, your family has all got the same flu virus, whatever, you all feel lousy, your dog never gets sick. Okay? Because the virus can't infect its cells. Right? And that's the case for lots of things, right? Um, things like like bird flu, for example, right? We were, everyone was really worried about that because it was something that actually could be transmitted from one species to another. It had a very, it was very virulent in that way, is that it could infect lots of different kinds of organisms, right? Um, but there are a lot of viruses that can only infect a certain species. Okay, so they're very kind of limited in that range. Now, showing you here, this is a basic diagram of what a virus does. Okay, It attaches to the membrane, it injects its own DNA through the membrane, and that DNA is actually very quickly transported by your cell's machinery to the nucleus. Right? Because that's where the cell keeps its DNA. And a cell knows if there's DNA like floating around on the inside, that it needs to go to the nucleus because it recognizes that DNA is important and fragile and it doesn't want it floating around inside the rest of the cell. It wants it protected within the nucleus with all the other DNA. So this DNA gets transported into your nucleus and then it simply splices itself in. Okay? Splice means to cut, cut a strand and fit itself in the, in the gap. Right? So it splices in. Now, what does your DNA tell your body to do? Yeah, your DNA is basically a set of instructions for making the things that are needed to keep you running. Right? There's a section of your DNA that tells you how to make insulin. Right? And that's a section of DNA in a diabetic that doesn't work quite right. right? Uh, there's a section of your DNA that tells you how to make, um, let's say, adrenaline or estrogen or testosterone or whatever. Okay? Or how to make uh, you know, the stuff that hair is made out of, how to make keratin. All of that stuff is all encoded in your DNA. So what a virus does is it cuts the DNA and splices itself into a section of the DNA that would be used often. So let's say your vi your, one of your cells in your pancreas, let's say, says, well, oh, we've got to make insulin, goes to the section of DNA that normally codes on how to make insulin, sends out the instructions to the parts of the cell that make the proteins. What do they make instead? They make a virus because now the viral DNA has been spliced in in its place. Right, so that gets sent out to the to the cell. The cell makes a virus. Here's the problem: Did the cell get what it wanted? So that creates what's called a feedback loop. All right, the cell didn't get what it wanted, so it sends back to the nucleus, "Hey, we asked for this stuff. Where is it?" So it sends out another message: "Make this stuff." Unfortunately, what does it make again? It makes another virus, and so on and so on until the cell is full of viruses and bursts and then all the viruses get out okay and they go out and they infect another cell and they start the process all over again all right so they essentially hijack your cell and make it do what they want okay they take it over and make it make the stuff that they want right as opposed to what it needs okay so that's kind of this process here you get the the uh, bacteria attaching, you get the DNA getting in and becoming part of your DNA, and then you start getting parts of viruses being built and assembled, and then the cell gets weak, pops, and the viruses all get out. Okay, and depending on the size of the cell, that can be a hundred to a thousand viruses. Okay, per cell, out they get. Right, and then they infect other cells, and that's why it seems like things like the flu get you really fast. Right. Like you, you go to bed and you got, oh, I got the little scratchy throat, you know, I don't feel 100%, you know, I got a little scratchy throat. You wake up in the morning and you're like, I'm going to have to get better to die. Okay, you know, it's, it can come that fast. You figure how quickly your cells can produce a thousand viruses and that process probably happened five, six, 20 times during the night while well, you suddenly got a lot of viruses running around your body. Okay, does that sort of make sense? 
Right. Now, that's why there's this big kind of deal about, you know, always washing your hands and things like that, especially if you shake hands with somebody. It's not so much that a virus itself, a single virus, is going to be passed from you to somebody else by shaking hands. A virus doesn't last outside the body for more than maybe a minute or two. But the problem is, is, you know, if they've sneezed, blown their nose, okay, you know, or whatever, and they've got some of their cells on their hand. If some of their cells have the virus in them, they get into your body, boom. Now you've got the transmission problem. Okay? And it's the same thing with the transmission of sexually transmitted diseases that are viral like HIV. Okay? HIV is only transmitted through blood okay? and, and sexual fluids, so semen and, and stuff like that. Okay? But those all contain cells, don't they? Right? So it's transmitted that way. All right? You can't transmit um, HIV through saliva. Right? Because in saliva, there's no what? Well, no cells, right? It's just a secretion. All right? It doesn't have any cells in it. Now, apparently they've done some studies, and if you were to supposedly drink about like a gallon of somebody else's saliva, you could possibly do that. Because there are some cells in your saliva that slough off from the inside of your mouth. All right? But uh, it, it was, I don't think they tested it as opposed to they figured out how many cells would be required to have an effective transmission of the virus. And yeah. Basically it was back in the eighties when they first discovered that HIV was out there, they were really concerned about it, right? And they were like, oh, you know, any type of fluid from body to body could transmit this and everyone was really scared. And so they thought even through saliva. So it was like even you could get it through kissing even. And they're like, no, no, you couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so to infect a cell, okay, very simply, to infect a cell, the virus just latches on. Now, here's the issue with your, with your immune system getting rid of viruses. The, the coat, the, the, the sort of shell, the capsid, stays on the outside of whatever cell was infected. And that's the only sign that the virus is there. That's what your body's immune system has to look for, is cells that have this capsid stuck to the outside. All right? that's, that's tough to do. That's like looking for a needle in a haystack. Okay. Yes, the protein is probably recognized as foreign, but there's not that much of it, right? When it sees a cell with that on the outside, it doesn't take care. It doesn't just kill this part. It's already dead. The the DNA is already in the cell. At this point, it has to kill the cell, right? Because the cell is assembling more viruses, and if it doesn't kill the cell, the viruses will get out, right? So to take care of a virus, you have to kill your infected cells. Well, basically, it just um, injects what's called, it makes them lice, which means it takes the, the lysosomes inside, breaks them, and the digestive enzymes get out and they, they eat themselves, yeah. Okay, now cytotoxic T cells have toxins in them that can kill other cells. Okay, there's a number of different ways. Some cells will just engulf the cells and eat them, all right, things like that. There's a number of different types of white blood cells within your blood that will kill cells in different ways. All right. Now, here's the thing about your immune system. Your immune system remembers. That's the point of getting a vaccination. All right. If you've been vaccinated for chickenpox or you've ever got the chickenpox, okay, you won't get it again because your body's fought it off once and it knows how. It recognizes that protein that's present on the outside of the chickenpox virus and as soon as that virus is present within your body, your body will do exactly what it did the last time and it'll kill it off effectively. All right. Problem is, some viruses mutate often, like the flu, right? That's why I don't get the flu vaccine, right? I'm not going to go in and get a needle for something that was last year's flu or whoever's best guess at what this year's flu is going to be, right? I'm just as well to get sick for a couple of days, get better, and be immune after that, right? That and the first time I ever got one of those, I was never sicker. Right? The day after I got the flu vaccine, I got the flu, and I've never been sicker, so I'm never getting one again. You got the chicken pox twice. That is ex exceptionally rare. Exceptionally rare. You may have had just the, the second time you got it, your immune system may have been slightly depressed. And I don't mean it was sad. <laughs> it was just uh, it, it very mild. Right. It does happen. It's rare. It's sometimes when you get older as well. Like, And by older, I don't mean... 
Listen up, guys. I don't mean like my age. I mean like much older than that. I know that seems like really old, but okay. Like if when you get in, let's say into your 70s, 80s, and your immune system starts to kind of peter out a bit, you can get the chicken pox again just because your immune system isn't up to par, but it's much more severe. What do they call it when you get it as an adult? Shingles, yeah, and it's really painful and it's awful. All right. Lice are bugs. It's not a virus. Yeah. Okay. With with lice, it's little it's little crawly bugs. Okay. And uh and they can jump. All right. Jump. Uh if you're if you're watching for them, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and so that's why like with little kids, like in elementary school, you know, you always get, I, I don't know, like last year my son's kindergarten class had that happen. Like we got the letter home, my, you know, it was like now you got to go get the lice shampoo because there was a kid with lice in your kid's class, right? But, but it happens all the time. Yeah. Well, they're playing together, right? They're really close or, you know, they're putting on each other's toques. Well, of course they're in the toque or the eggs are in the toque or the hat or whatever, right? And so they get on and then there's more of them, right? So, yeah, they get, it gets passed that way. It's actually a, a bug. Blood. Yeah. They, they go down to the bottom of your hair, to the scalp, and they chew on the scalp until you start to bleed, and then they suck the blood. Yes. You get itchy because they're biting you. Yeah. And eating your, eating your blood. Now, now you wish you hadn't asked, right? Now you're... Everyone's, going, everyone's scratching their head now. <laughs> Okay, give you some idea here because I often get this this question, guys. Is well then then how does how does HIV work? Okay, well HIV works a bit differently because it's very slow, right? The HIV uh, infection process takes a long time, right? It isn't like the flu where overnight you can be you can be down with it, all right? But with HIV, the process is a lot slower, and the problem with HIV is it infects the cells that your body produces to get rid of it. All right? So it's kind of insidious that way in that as you get as your body detects that your that th this virus is present, it secretes more of the cells that that virus actually infects. All right? And so then it kind of gets going, right? It infects your white blood cells. So the HIV uh, or AIDS virus, HIV virus consists of two strands of RNA and some enzymes encased in a coating, so the virus then will bond to a white blood cell. All right, so it encounters a T cell. Okay, Proteins on the virus bind to a receptor that's on the outside of your cell. Okay, And then the virus enters the cell. Now in this case with a retrovirus, the the whole virus actually kind of gets in. All right, Not the not necessarily the capsid, but this whole uh, the whole kind of shell encasing the, DNA, the RNA gets in there. Okay, RNA is converted into double-stranded DNA by an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. So essentially it turns it into DNA so that it will go to the nucleus, okay? Um, and then for uh, number four here, next the enzyme called integrase incorporates the virus's genetic material into your DNA. Okay? The viral DNA uses the cell's manufacturing process, directing it to churn out viral DNA and proteins. And then these special enzymes cut the viral proteins into shorter pieces so that they can be assembled into new viruses, okay? And then out they go, all right? And they go out through a process called budding. They don't even rupture the cell, right? So in that way, they're also quite a bit well smarter. I don't want to personify here, but okay, they they uh, they don't kill the cell directly. They'll just keep milking the cell for quite a while, and other viruses will bud out of it, and then go on and infect other cells, and that cell will keep functioning and keep making more viruses, All right? Does that sort of make sense? So it essentially hijacks the cell, takes over the cell's metabolic machinery, and has it build more and more uh, viral bodies that uh, that can take over your cell and, and obviously make other ones. Uh, there are there is apparently now a very effective treatment, okay, um, for HIV depending on what stage of the infection you are at. Uh, if you're in the latter stages where your immune system is already pretty much fried, there's not much that they can do. Um, but if you catch it early enough, there are treatments that can essentially give you a regular lifespan. You will still always have 
HIV, um, but it will not get to the point where it um, depresses your immune system. Um, it used to be that everyone considered AIDS and HIV to be the same thing. HIV is the virus. AIDS is the, is the symptom of the disease. So people can be HIV positive and not develop AIDS now okay, with proper treatment. AIDS, guys, stands for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, all right, which is what HIV causes. But if you can keep the HIV virus suppressed, then your immune system stays strong and you don't... I mean, essentially what kills most people who have AIDS is pneumonia. Okay, they catch some simple virus that you or I would fight off without even knowing we had it because their immune system is so weakened. They can't produce any more white blood cells because they're just shot. Their immune system has been essentially sucked dry by, by the HIV virus, and so they can't fight off even the simplest infection. And that's usually what gets them. All right? But with the new treatments now, I'm not sure exactly how they work, but from what I've heard, they, they keep the immune system up so that you can't get to the latter stage. No. Yeah, uh, I haven't read it, but uh, yeah. Uh, as far as I know, there's no way to completely get rid of it. Okay, and that's of course that's of course the issue, right? Is that it's transmittable, all right? And you're always going to have it. Once you're HIV positive, you're always going to be HIV positive, and so, right? Then that's that's a big worry because your your blood is dangerous to everybody. Okay, your other bod bodily fluids, okay, are well, not all of your bodily fluids, but your your sexual bodily fluids are dangerous to everybody. Okay, and so yeah, that's the big concern there, obviously. All right. Um, yeah. So we've already talked about that part there. This here, guys, is a picture of a uh, white blood cell that is infected with HIV. All right. All of these little gray, light gray things here, are an HIV virus budding out of that cell. So you can see there's a lot of HIV viruses being produced by that white blood cell. Right? That's actually what white blood cells look like too. It, it's not because it's infected with HIV that it looks so funky. That's what they look like. Okay. All right. Now, emergence and reoccurrence of viral infections. So how does, how does a virus get going and make lots of people sick? The most common way, an existing virus evolves and causes disease in, in individuals who had developed an immunity to an ancestral version of it. This is what happens with colds and flu, right? Every year you get sick, right? You've got the flu once, but you get it again, right? Because it mutates all the time, right? And that, that's what happened, uh, what, a few years ago there in Toronto and, uh, oh, what was that what's stuff called? No, it wasn't... Was it swine flu? I thought it was called something else. H1N1. Yeah, that's what it was. I was trying to think of the letters and numbers. Okay. H1N1 virus was essentially just an influenza virus, but it had mutated and it was highly virulent and highly infectious, and you know it, it killed a number of people. And you know, so there wasn't really anything you could do about it except try and stay as healthy and strong as you could, so your immune system was capable of fighting it off. Because it really didn't kill anybody who was a healthy and I mean healthy, like strong kind of individual who had a good solid immune system. It typically just killed, unfortunately, children and the elderly, okay, whose immune systems were already weak. Okay? So most of the time you're okay unless there's some sort of strange mutation okay, that comes along. All right, does that sort of make sense there? So that one happens all the time. Because a simple organism like a virus, it's not doesn't take much for its DNA to be altered quickly and then have it have different characteristics. Okay, uh, if you go on to university, we did this in my like first year genetics course. You would take E. coli bacteria, and you could make them resistant to penicillin by putting them under a UV lamp for 30 seconds. Okay, in 30 seconds of exposure to ultraviolet light, you could mutate an E. coli bacterium till it was immune to penicillin. All right, not all of them. All right, but you could mutate a few, and it only takes even one. Right? And then if it's immune to penicillin, I put it on a dish that contains nutrients and penicillin. All the others die except that one. It divides, 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 and I've suddenly got a whole bunch of penicillin-resistant E. coli bacteria. All right? So it doesn't take much. For a virus, it takes even less because they're even more, or, or sorry, less complex than, uh, than a bacteria. Okay. 
An existing virus can spread from one host species to another. Okay, so this would be like the bird flu. All right, typically just infected birds for the longest time, but there was some mutation and it did allow it to infect other organisms after the fact. Okay, and an existing virus can disseminate from a small population to become more widespread. Okay, HIV AIDS is an example of that. All right, if you go back around the time I was born, okay, kind of late 70s, there wasn't, people didn't know much about AIDS and HIV, um, and what segment of the population at that time was most commonly diagnosed with it? Anybody know? There was only kind of a small group that it was typically found in. Give you a hint. The name for it back in the day, and it's not very politically correct, but this is what its name was. It was the gay plague. Because typically it was only found, only diagnosed most commonly in homosexual men. And so it was assumed that this was just something, unfortunately, that only infected this group of people. All right? But, obviously, with something that's transmitted through bodily fluids and sexual contact and stuff like that, it can quickly disseminate from a small group to a much larger population. And that's exactly what happened. No one was testing for it. A lot of people got infected through blood transfusions in the early 80s. Okay? Because they didn't they weren't aware that they had it. They went and gave blood, you know, thinking they were helping somebody, and then that person got infected with HIV, okay? Or if you had someone who was bisexual, they could, you know, take it from one community to the other, and then obviously it became very widespread after that, okay? The Ebola virus was another example of that. It was typically only found in kind of small little African villages, okay? And then the aid workers that went down to help brought it to other places, and it got kind of more widespread from there. Okay, so you typically see that. This is going to be a bigger and bigger problem for us now. Right? And H1N1 was the proof of that. Okay? It proved that the World Health Organization is completely powerless to contain a viral outbreak. Because right? as soon as they detected its presence first in China, they started closing airports, thinking that that would stop the spread of it. Right? But unfortunately, people had gotten out before the airports were closed. And now, I mean, we can take viruses from any part of the world to any other part of the world very quickly okay, before anyone ever knows. So, you know, if you're one of those like zombie apocalypse kind of people, right, okay, yeah, stuff can get spread really, really fast because we're so interconnected now, okay, and we have the ability to quickly travel from one part of the world to another. All right, I want you to answer those four questions. we got enough time to do that. So answer those four questions and we'll go over them and then that'll be it. All right, so um, are viruses really alive? I mean, it's hard to say. It's mostly an opinion thing, but based on what we've talked about and what uh, a living thing has to do and obviously be made up of cells, they don't seem to fit that definition. Okay. Um, why is a virus considered an intracellular parasite? Right, within the host cell. Intra actually means within, right? That's why, uh, you know, if you play, like, you know, games in the gym at lunch, it's called intramurals, okay? Because it's within the school, right? Everybody follow me on that? That's what intra means. Um, number three, how can you build or receive immunity to a virus? Okay, you get vaccinated. That's called artificial immunity, okay? You get the virus. That's called natural immunity, all right. If you get the virus and you get better, you're immune to it. If you get vaccinated for it, you're immune to it. That's artificial. All right. So those are the two ways that you can uh, get it. There's also maternal immunity. Um, for infants who are breastfeeding, some of the mother's immunity can be passed to the infant through breast milk. All right, which is why uh, breastfeeding is, is considered to be a pretty important thing okay, for infants is that a lot of antibodies and immunity can actually be transmitted through the breast milk bef while the infant's immune system is still sort of um, you know, in its infancy, for lack of a better word. Okay, and why do you suppose lots of fluids are good for fighting a cold caused by a virus? Because you're always told, go home, drink lots of fluids, get plenty of rest, right? You're always told to do that. Why would that help? Uh, it doesn't necessarily promote cell division, but if you're killing a whole bunch of your own cells, is that going to put a lot of toxins into your blood? Yeah. Water helps you to flush all of that stuff out. Okay. All right. We'll see you guys tomorrow.